Right, Proverbs chapter 22, let's look at verse number 1. A good name is rather to be chosen than great riches, and loving favor rather than silver and gold. Now right out of the beginning, he starts about a good name and loving favor, and he compares it to riches. It makes me think of Solomon, and that's who this was written to. Right? This was written by King David to Solomon so that he could be a great leader. And what does a great leader need? Well, he says you need a good name. He's talking about your reputation. He's talking about your integrity. And again, Proverbs is written to his son for leadership purposes because he would become a king. But God saw fit to make sure that every Christian would have this and be able to read this. God wants every Christian to have this same wisdom. And you know what? We're all leaders, spiritually speaking. All of us are, have stewardship over other people, and it's very important for us to remember this. A good name is rather to be chosen than great riches. Having a good name with God, having a good name without, is more important than having a big bank account. He says, and loving favor rather than silver or gold. Loving favor. That's people that like you because of your love. That's people that have favor. They prefer you because of the type of person you are. I mean, it's, it's, they love to love you because you're known for your love, right? In Daniel 1, he talks about, in Daniel's situation, it says, But Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's meat, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore, he requested of the prince and the eunuchs that he might not defile him. So, so Daniel said, hey, I'm going to purpose in my heart. I'm going to do it God's way. I want to make sure I have a good name with God above all else. And he was a servant. He was a slave. They could have put him to death like that. So he requests. He comes as a, as a loving person, right? In the next verse, he says, now God had brought Daniel into favor and tender love with the prince of the eunuchs. Daniel said, I'm going to purpose in my heart. I'm going to make a goal in my heart to do things right according to God. I want to maintain my integrity and have a good name according to God. And I don't care what the rest of the world says. God will bless me. In the next verse, he did. It says that God brought Daniel into favor and tender love with the prince. Right? So as Christians, sometimes it's like, well, it's easier just to go along. Well, you know what? Sometimes we need to take a stand. And when we take a stand, we think we're alone, but we're not. And yet God says, good, now you're building a foundation he can work with, and you'll have a good name. You'll have loving favor from other people. He purposed to follow God. You know, and, and goals in leadership are very important. And all of you, I'm, I am talking to a room full of leaders. You're a Christian. You're saved. God has purposed for you to lead others. And, and so knowing that, you need to plan as a leader and you need to make sure that you maintain your integrity. Leadership is the goal and, and you need to have goals. And you know, like I said, I believe everyone here is a leader in God's eyes, one way or another. We all have extended family, some saved or some not saved, that look to us for Bible wisdom. Right? God says, hey, look, I've elevated you to a position where others will seek your counsel. So we need to lead others in the right path. We may have people at work that will bring things up and they're like, oh, wow, you, you know what you're talking about. You know the Bible. You know God. And therefore, they will look at you as a spiritual leader. And this is a humbling thing. Leadership isn't, yeah, I'm the guy. It's, okay, how can I serve you? How can I help you? Loving favor. That means you're loved for your love. The world looks at you and says, man, I just like that guy. He's so nice. He's, he's always got a good attitude. He's always got a good smile. Right? So as a leader, we need to make sure that we keep the priorities right. A good name is rather to be chosen than great riches, and loving favor rather than silver and gold. So the rest of the chapter, he's giving us instruction on how to be a good leader, how to maintain a good name and obtain loving favor both from God and from man. In the next verse, look at verse number two. It says, the rich and the poor meet together. The Lord is maker of them all. He's saying, hey, God has put us all on a level playing field right? It's only your faith that'll get you out of this world, right? So we shouldn't look down on people just because they're poor. And really, it shouldn't be this. You shouldn't look up, look down on people because they're rich either. You need to give the gospel to all. We should not be a respecter of persons. That's the way Jesus was, and that's the way we ought to be. We've been given the ultimate example of a leader. We need to follow his example. Look at verse 3. A prudent man foreseeth the evil and hideth himself, but the simple pass on and are punished. A prudent man foreseeth the evil. That's that you see a trap and you avoid it. 
All right? I want you to go to John chapter 10. John chapter 10. A prudent man foreseeth the evil and hideth himself, but the simple pass on and are punished. Again, Jesus gave us the perfect example of spiritual leadership, and that example is of a protecting shepherd. And, you know, today there are parents that don't really care about the outcome of their children. They foresee evil on the television, and they say, well, what could happen if they watch that? The, the kids will be all right. I can have a moment of peace, and my children can watch whatever they want. Instead of foreseeing that evil and warning and protecting their children from the evil, they allow it to go into their eyes, they allow it to go into their ears, and sometimes that stuff never leaves. There are things that we have seen that we regret. There are, there are things that people have looked at that will never go away. And knowing that, that it's evil, it's hurtful, it can destroy your thoughts, it can hurt you spiritually, shouldn't we protect others? Shouldn't we do everything we can to protect those little eyes from having to see some of those things and avoiding that snare, avoiding the punishment if they just pass on and, and take part of that? In John chapter 10, look at verse number 10. The thief cometh not but to steal, to kill, and to destroy. I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. Right? As a leader, you need to lay your life down for others. You need, to, you need to protect people from the wickedness in the world. You need to protect your family. You need to protect your wife, men. Ladies, you need to protect your children from the things they may hear or see, even if it's in a grocery store. Men, leave the buggy and go. Just get out of there. If it's that bad, just walk away from the situation. Our, our child's minds is so important. And we are raising the next generation of leaders. And here Jesus has given us an example. Well, there's the thief, and then there's the shepherd. Right? Well, who do we follow? We follow the shepherd. Well, how do we act? Well, we act like a shepherd. We, we are walking in his footsteps. We're trying to become like him. And as a leader, we need to be vigilant and, and beware of the harm that's on the horizon. We need to protect others. We need to stand guard and look out. Back up in this chapter to verse number one. Uh, this is a really interesting passage that Jesus is speaking in here. Look at verse number one. He says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that entereth not by the door into the sheepfold, but climbeth up some other way, the same as a thief and a robber. Right? He's warning that the devil's trying to get in, and there are false prophets that want to get in, and he says, you have to enter into the door. Right? You have to have the shepherd to be saved here, and if you do it any other way, you're not saved. You think of the, the application with Calvinism. Well, I didn't choose to believe. You know, God forced it on me, and my works will prove it. Okay, well, you're not of the shepherd, right? In fact, you are fallen from grace if you think that your own works are, are proof that you're saved. If you think that, well, I didn't choose to believe. I, I, that's, if I choose to believe on Jesus, that's me saving myself. You don't understand the gospel if that's what you believe. Calvinism is a wicked deception. Man, it's got so many people confused. Jesus is very clear here. There's only one way to enter in, and that's by believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. Look at the next verse, verse number two. He says, but he that entereth in by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the porter openeth, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calleth his own sheep by name, and leadeth them out. So here he's saying, hey, there's only one way. It's the door. If you didn't come in by the door, you don't belong. And you should know because he calleth them by name. Jesus knows your name. And guess what? A stranger doesn't know your name. You think we were talking about this mega church, right? Those mega churches where they got, you know, five different campuses and they're at the pastors a thousand miles away. He doesn't know the sheep's name. He doesn't even know if that sheep exists. He could care less about them. They just want to shear the sheep. They want to take what they can from the flock, and they could care less. They want all the glory. They want all the pride. They are not the shepherd. Look what he says in the next verse. Verse 4, he says, And when he putteth forth his own sheep, he goeth before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. Jesus gave us the example. When we hear something out of the Scriptures, we should follow it. And how do you teach your children? Well, the same way. We open up the Scriptures, and they will follow you as you follow Christ. But he warns about voices we don't know. Look at the next verse. And a stranger will they not follow, but will flee from him, for they know not the voice of strangers. Somebody else, oh, no, I don't think I like that. That doesn't sound right. That's not of God. I don't want to be part of that. Right? And as Christians, we need to be vigilant. We need to be on guard. Remember he said, a prudent man foreseeth the evil, 
and hideth himself. A prudent man sees the evil and he protects others. He protects himself. He protects his house. Right? And as Jesus did, he's protecting the flock. Jesus loved us so much he laid his life down for the flock. And that's the attitude we need to have. Look at verse number 6. This parable spake Jesus unto them, but they understood not what things they were which he spake unto them. Then said Jesus unto them again, Verily, verily, I say unto you, I am the door of the sheep. So, and this is an interesting thing because he, he is both the door and the shepherd in this, but he's making the point there's only one way in. There's only one way to heaven. There's only one way of salvation, and it's through the door of the Lord Jesus Christ. He says, all that at verse 8, he says, all that ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. Right? The sheep should know the voice of the shepherd well enough that they're not being deceived. That they're not just, well, I don't know, that kind of sounds all right. Listen, as a Christian, it's your duty to be sharp enough in the Bible that when you hear a false doctrine or a fake Bible or a false Christian, you can discern it. Yeah. We're at the flea market, we're preaching out there, and this guy comes up and it's, it's all by faith alone, he says. And then, you know, everything he's saying, it's like, he sounds right, but something's wrong. Man, my spirit was not bearing witness with his spirit. Something was se severely wrong with this guy. Then he starts claiming to be a missionary that does medical things, and he's collecting money, and, and he keeps talking. I said, well, let me ask you this. Where do you think repentance plays a role in salvation? Well, I could answer that anyway. I could answer it depending on who's asking. And I, well, I just want to know the truth. What do you actually believe? Well, repentance and faith are inseparable. And what do you mean by that? Do you mean, would you say someone has to repent of your sins to be saved? Or do you think that it's all by faith alone in Jesus Christ? Oh, well, yeah, you have to repent of your sins, but of course it's all by faith. And it's like he's trying to answer out of both sides of his mouth. So I said, well, well, let me ask you this. Is faith the gift of God or is grace the gift of God? And he kind of snickers again. He's like, well, I don't know what answer. I'm like, I want to know if you're a Calvinist. Well, of course I'm a Calvinist. You can't deny the doctrines. And then, and then soon enough, here he is. He's saying, you have to endure to the end. Evidence of your salvation is your works, that if you don't repent of your sins, you are never saved. You know what a Calvinist believes? That they were saved before they heard the gospel. Do you understand? A Calvinist believes they're saved without believing the gospel. That is a false gospel. That is a different God. There's a distinction there. I mean, you cannot associate with somebody. Can two walk together except they be agreed? Why won't we just invite Calvinists to come on into the church? Hey, they can come in. We'll preach the gospel to them. If they reject it, I don't want them sticking around. I don't want them poisoning the well. I'm not going to say, well, you said faith, so you must be saved. No, I'm not going to do that. That would be a lie. That would be a disservice to both us and them. It's very important to, to understand this distinction between the gospel of John Calvin, which is a false gospel. It is a repent of your sins to prove that you're saved gospel. And I, don't, I didn't have to do anything to get saved. God picked me because I'm special. And you I mean, that's like some sort of a, a strange pickup line. Like, do you, do you think you're special? Me? Well, yeah. That's Calvinism. And Calvinists don't evangelize because they say, well, what's the point? God will save who he wants. And others might argue, well, I'm only a three-point cow. I'm a one-point cow. There is no such... Look, Calvinism is a wicked, wicked doctrine. And Jesus essentially debunked all of those doctrines in his basic teachings. Jesus is the door. I am the door of the sheep. Look what he says in verse 8. All that ever came before me are thieves and robbers. But the sheep did not hear them. The sheep don't listen to John Calvin. The sheep don't listen to John MacArthur. They don't listen to John Piper. They don't listen to these false prophets. They know a devil when they hear a devil. And Calvinism is the doctrine of devils. It's thieves and robbers. They want to steal you away from the Word of God. They want to say, well, you can't read the context of a passage. You need the exegesis. That, that I need to lead you out of the scriptures. You need to read some cardinal, some pope, some Catholic, some reformer that, that said works were necessary for salvation and we should baptize babies. We don't read that junk around here. We read the Bible and the Bible alone. Amen. Exogesis means get you out of the Bible. No, I believe in context. You mean just read it for what it says? Amen. And let the Holy Spirit explain it to you. Don't hang out with Calvinists. They're wolves. Look what he says. Verse 9, I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved. And he shall go in and out and find pasture. You notice here in verse 9, he says, Jesus says, I'm the door, and if you come in to me, you are saved. Not, well, we'll find out if you're saved at the end of your life, if you stay a reformer. It doesn't say, uh, well, I will force you through the door, and there's no going back. No, it says you need to walk through the door. 
You would have to do it. You have to choose. Verse 11, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. Now, Jesus shifts gears here. He went from saying, I'm the door. Now he's saying, I am the shepherd. He's trying to help us understand this. In a, in a, he's, he's preaching in a way that can be made sense by bringing it down to our level. He says, I'm the shepherd, and I lay my life down for the sheep. He's saying, I want you sheep to be saved. There's only one way in, and that's how the shepherd comes in. He says, I am the shepherd, and now I will save you. Verse 12. But he that is an hireling, and not the shepherd, whose own the sheep are not. See it, the wolf. Now, now, the hireling is not a shepherd. The shepherd is the one that will lay his life down. The hireling just comes in while it's convenient. He's hired for a time, and he says, whose own the sheep are not. He doesn't know the sheep. He doesn't dwell with the sheep. He doesn't care about the sheep. He's somewhere else, right? But the shepherd, look what he says. He says, but he that is an hireling and not the shepherd, whose own the sheep are not, see it, the wolf coming, and leave it, the sheep, and he fleeth, right, because he's scared. And the wolf catcheth them and scattereth the sheep. When you see churches scattered by false prophets that come in, they're a hireling. When somebody comes in and half the church leaves, guess what? That's probably a hireling. That's a false prophet. The sheep say, I don't know his voice. I don't trust this man. I'm out of here. Yeah. Understand, Jesus is trying to help us understand here. We follow the Lord Jesus Christ. He is our shepherd. And when the wolf comes, Jesus will fight that wolf to the death. He would lay down his life to protect his very own. Look at verse 13. The hireling fleeth, because he is an hireling, and careth not for the sheep. Jesus, again, in verse 14. I am the good shepherd, and know my sheep, and am known of mine. Jesus says, you know me, I know you. You know he's not a hireling. You know he loves you. That's why he laid his life down. That's what he goes on and says. Look at verse 15. As the Father knoweth me, even so know I the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. And other sheep I have, which are not of this fold, them also I must bring, and they shall hear my voice, and there shall be one fold and one shepherd. Therefore doth my Father love me, because I lay down my life, that I might take it again. Why does the Father love the Son? Because the Son said, not my will, but thine. Right? If it be possible, take this cup, but yet, not why, my will, but thine. I'll lay my life down. Look at verse 18. No man taketh it from me, but I lay it down myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. This commandment have I received of my Father. So he's been given a commandment by the Father. Go die for the sheep. And Jesus had a choice. He had the power to lay down his life. He has the power to take it up again. He had the power to obey him because he was, will, he was obedient even unto death. The Father loved him for it. Go back to Proverbs chapter 22. True leadership is going to look out for others. And this is what David was instructing Solomon in. That that's the type of leader that he ought to be. And obviously Solomon's sons failed in this regard. You know, they, oh, you know, chastise them with scorpions, right? You know, make, it, make their burden even worse. Well, that's not wisdom. That's not godly. That's not love. That's not caring for people. That's a hireling. And that was the problem with Solomon's sons, is they didn't read these Proverbs. They didn't put them in their heart. And they ended up being the hireling that David was warning against right here. You're in Proverbs chapter 22. Look at verse number 4. By humility and the fear of the Lord are riches and honor and life. Now, as leaders, sometimes we wonder, well, well I need riches, honor, and life. How am I going to get these things in life? How do I get the, that good name? I need honor, right? I need life. I need health and things to be sustained. I need riches, right? Hey, money isn't everything, but it's right up there with oxygen, right? Try living without oxygen. Well, try living without money, right? Well, what's he say? So how do we get those things? He says, by humility and the fear of the Lord comes these things. Well, how can I make sure as a leader that I'm taking care of business? Well, seek ye first the kingdom of God, right? Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added unto you. Make sure that you obey him and you do it in the fear of the Lord and he will take care of you. How can I take care of my business? How can I take care of my home? Mom, how can I take care of my children? Well, you need to fear the Lord. He says, by humility and the fear of the Lord are riches and honor and life. There's such peace in that verse. Well, what do I have to do to fix all my problems in life? Well, you need, to, you need to be humble before God, and you need to fear God, 
and he will take care of the rest of the details. The ones you can't see, the ones that, hey, his goal is maybe six months from now, you'll say, boy, it's amazing how I, did, how I didn't see it then, but God had it all worked out. It's amazing how God was working something I didn't see, and I didn't know how it worked, but you know, as long as I kept him first, he worked it out. In Proverbs 23, he says, labor not to be re rich, cease from thine own wisdom. There comes a time and a point where you just have to let go, right? You just have to let go and let God guide you and lead you, and he will provide for riches and honor and life. Amen. Look at verse number five. Thorns and snares are in the way of the froward. He that doth keep his soul shall be far from them. He says these perverse people, the crooked path, you know, is something to be warned. You should avoid the crooked path and the crooked people. And if you keep your soul from that, then you won't have those thorns and snares and problems in life. Verse 6, he says, train up a child in the way he should go. And when he is old, he will not depart from it. Now, this is biblical wisdom. This is written on how to make good leaders. How to be a good leader as well, you lead your child. Well, what do you teach them? Well, you train them up in the way he should go. You don't just train them up and say, well, the world says you should learn these things. No, you figure out what they need to know and you take care of business yourself. You be diligent in your own business, in your own household. Train up a child in the way he should go. And when he is old, he will not depart from it. Well, how do we train children? Well, he says, thou shalt teach them. Right throughout the whole day, as parents were commanded to teach our children. Look at verse 15 in this chapter. Foolishness is bound in the heart of a child, but the rod of correction shall drive it far from him. Children are silly. They're just silly. And they, they get silly upon silly. I mean, foolishness upon foolishness. One starts giggling, then the other one starts giggling. And before you know it, the whole room's in laughter. And it's like, why? Who's laughing at what? Who knows? Well, my one-year-old is a social laugher. She's, she's, I mean, she just laughs when everybody else laughs. What a happy baby, right? But you know what? Foolishness is bound in the heart of the child. The child, if left to themselves, they'll bring their mother to shame, right? So foolishness is not good. We must direct them in the way they should go. And we do it according to this by the rod of correction. Foolishness is in the heart of a child, but the rod of correction will drive it far from them. The Bible is teaching that we need to spank our children. We need to correct our children to warn them about foolishness. You look at the world today, well, I don't tell my children about God. I don't spank my children. Yeah, and where are they going to end up? In drugs? In, in prison? Right? God haters? And then they wonder why. My children went off to college and they came back and they're liberal Democrats with purple hair and they hate me. Well, good job, mom and dad. You should have trained them yourself. You should have corrected them while there was a chance to fix it. He said, chasten thy son while there is hope, and let not thy soul spare for his crying. Let not thy soul spare for his crying. Sometimes children cry just when they see the rod. They don't even have to get corrected. They start crying. Oh, no, not me. Oh, wait, I'll finish. Still, let me. Oh, no. They're like, no, sorry. I, I can't spare for your crying. I need to correct you so you understand that in this world, there is repercussions for what you do. What you sow, ye shall reap. You disobey God. He will judge you. There is a punishment to come. The world needs to understand this. This is very important. And we as Christians, we need to lead the way in this. We need to make sure that we are correcting our children. And Proverbs 23 says, Withhold not correction from the child, for if thou beatest him with the rod, he shall not die. Now, that's an older word, beat with the rod. It doesn't mean like a baseball bat. You do it kindly. I mean, you're not hurting someone. You're not trying to, uh, it's not child abuse. Well, it's called a rod of correction. And it's very important to understand if you don't correct your child and it doesn't hurt a little bit, you're probably not doing any good. If you just say, well, I'm going to, oh, I'm going to put you in time out. Guess what? That doesn't work. That will not work. And I've heard people give this like anecdotal evidence. Well, I know this one kid and he never got corrected, but he's a pretty good child today. Well, pretty good according to whose standard? Does he love God? Does he know his Bible? Is he saved? Does he obey his parents? I mean, think about it. what really matters in life. We need to be trained because you can just say, well, they have a good job. They selfishly do whatever they want. So I guess they're doing all right. Well, that's not the standard. The standard is they would grow up and fear the Lord. They would be humble before the Lord. And it's interesting, he, he talks about the rod of correction. So again, there has to be a distinction between somebody who sits down, talks to their child, explains what they did wrong. Listen, that's how God works. He's given us his word. He will, when you read the Bible, God's going to reveal to you where you're messing up. That's God talking to you, saying, hey, that thing, you need to fix it. You need to get it out. You need to do the best you can to overcome it. 
Well, as a parent, I believe it's our responsibility not to just fly off the handle and get angry with our children and yell at them, right? We're not supposed to provoke them to anger, provoke them to wrath. Instead, we are supposed to help them understand why they're in trouble. Sit them down. Ask them, do you know why you're in trouble? Explain to them what they did wrong. Make it clear. Make sure that you have a pattern and a method and that you are in control because if you're not in control, then it's not going to be successful. The rod of correction here is contrasted. Look at verse number eight. It says, he that soweth iniquity shall reap vanity and the rod of his anger shall fail. Now I've met children that were just scared to death of dad. And they kept everything from dad and they would lie to dad and they, they, they didn't respect God because they didn't respect dad. They were more afraid of dad's anger than they were of correction. Uh, so a dad that just flies off the handle and they have this rod of anger, it will fail. But now the rod of correction, the rod of correction is to correct the problem. It's not to demonstrate the anger. I'll show you I'm angry. Well, that's not of God. What is of God? Son, sit down. Here's what you're supposed to do. Here's what you did. Here's where you're wrong. You must be instructed in the right way. You must be corrected so you don't keep making the same mistake. There's a big difference between correction and anger. The fool is known as an angry man. A wise man, a Christian, ought to have correction and order and patience. We have to be patient in children. We instruct them while there is time. They can learn these lessons now before it's too late. Now look at verse number 7 here. The rich ruleth over the poor, and the borrower is servant to the lender. So what do we teach our children? Don't go in debt, right? We need to teach our children good stewardship over money to avoid servitude. Son, if you don't want to be a slave your whole life, then you need to learn to work for your money. You need to learn to save your money. You need to learn to invest your money and not just blow it on bubble gum. The kids are just, they get a $5 bill and it's gone that day. Well, you know, they're probably not going to be very successful in life. And if at a young age you can begin instilling these values that the rich ruleth over the poor. You can say, son, do you want to be rich or do you want to be poor? Because guess what? If you choose to be foolish with your finances, you'll be the poor man that serves the rich. He says, the rich ruleth over the poor and the borrower is servant to the lender. Children, it's better to be the one lending money than the one borrowing money. It's important to understand, instead of spending it all at once, maybe you want to save it for a rainy day when you need it the most, so you don't have to borrow from someone else. Look at verse number 8 again. He says, He that soweth iniquity shall reap vanity, and the rod of his anger shall fail. So again, this is instruction in leadership. This is instruction to children. He says, Don't sow sin. You'll reap nothing. Right? If you sow to the, wor the wind, you reap the whirlwind. What's he saying? If you sow to iniquity and transgressions and just selfishness in your flesh, you will gain nothing in this world. It will actually hurt you. It will go backwards. Verse number 9, he says, He that hath a bountiful eye shall be blessed, for he giveth of his bread to the poor. Remember how we talked at the beginning about loving favor. A good name and loving favor and it, it's the wise man that is saving that has a bountiful eye they're taking care of business so they can give to the poor when they need it verse number 10 cast out the scorner and contention shall go out yea strife and reproach shall cease he's saying get the haters out you got to get in balance or you'll get devoured he said cast out the scorner scorning is hate Right? Somebody that's running their mouth in a hateful way. Cast out that scorner, and the contention will go out. Yea, strife and reproach shall cease. How can we just have some peace? We'll get rid of the hater. Get the hater out of your presence. Tell them to stay over there and leave you alone. And guess what? Then you'll have peace. You won't be devoured by their hateful mouth. Verse number 11. He that loveth pureness of heart, for the grace of his lips, the king shall be his friend. Now this goes, you know, this makes me think about salvation. You know, how do I know what's in somebody's heart? Well, it's what comes out of their lips, right? What do I know that, how do I know what you really believe by asking you and eventually you'll tell on yourself, right? So here when he says, he that loveth pureness of heart, somebody that wants to be pure in their heart, somebody that's asking God for purity, Lord, help me to grow, Lord, help me to do better, right? I mean, we ought to be asking God, you know, many of us would say, well, I want to be better at work. I want to be a better husband or I want to be a better wife. Well, are you asking God for that? Are you asking God to help you? When you look at your wife, do you say, God, 
Help me to be the husband she deserves. Help me to be a better man than I am today. Are you praying to God? Because he says you have not because you ask not. So this person that dwells on purity, he says, he that loveth pureness of heart. That's the person that when you see your problems, you see your sins, in purity you go to God. And you say, okay, God, I'm failing on this, but I want to do better. Lord, help me to do better. God, help me to be a better person, a better leader, a better Christian, a better mother, father, child, wherever you're at, ask God to help you with this. So if you do, he says, he that loveth pureness of heart, for the grace of his lips the king shall be his friend. So what will come through your lips, the graceful things that come out of your lips will be evidence of the, the love that's in your heart. And even the king will want to be your friend. You know, everybody wants to be a friend of a king. Well, he's rich. He's got everything. He's got power. He, instead, he says, why don't you love pureness? And then the king will be attack, attracted to you. They will desire the wisdom that comes out of your lips. People usually put it the other way. They say, I just want to be close to the king so they know who I am. So maybe I'll get something from him. No, why don't you focus on pureness in your heart? You be righteous in here, then it will come out of there, and others will hear it and say, yeah, I, that makes sense. That's why they'll have loving favor towards you, and you'll have a good name in their eyes because of the pureness inside of your heart. And th again, this is contrasted to the scorner. You know, not scorn, purity in leadership. In Ephesians 4, he says, let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. What's the goal? Not corrupt communication, not scorning coming out of our mouth, but rather grace to the hearers. That's why if we're out soul winning, and I've had it happen many times, and look, there's a time and a place for a rebuke, and there's other times you just walk away. Oh, well, you probably wouldn't want me at, my, at your church. Why is that? I'm LGBTQ. Yep, yeah, okay, thank you. See you later. Maybe not. You know, not even, hey, have a good day, God bless you. Not even going to say that, but at the same time, I don't have to rebuke them. I don't have to yell at them. They know where they're at. They know where they're going. They know who they are. And once I figure out who they are, let's go. I tried to preach the gospel. They didn't receive it. Wonder why. Oh, there's a different spirit inside of them. They've got a devil. I'm going to leave them alone. I don't have to pick fights. I don't have to throw rocks. Oh, I saw that, that queer bumper sticker. I'm going to go bust it. Why? That's not what we're called to do. You think you're going to convert them by busting in their bumper? It's foolishness. You think about it. We as Christians ought to have grace coming to the hearers. Minister grace to the hearers. Look at verse number 12 here. The eyes of the Lord preserve knowledge, and he overthroweth the words of the transgressor. The eyes of the Lord preserve knowledge. God will take care of the truth. He'll preserve it. And He will overthrow the words of the transgressor. He will destroy those that are saying things wrong and wicked. Right? Again, grace, not scorning. Cast out the scorner. Verse 13, The slothful man saith, There is a lion without. I shall be slain in the streets. So, written to leaders here. What's the application? Be a good leader. Fight laziness. Teach your children to fight against laziness. Be the guy on the job that's willing to do the worst job, the hardest part, and God will bless that. He will take care of you. There's a lion without. I shall be slain in the streets. Oh, well, we can't do that. That's too dangerous. That's too hard. That's going to take too long. You say, get out of my way. You jump in there, and you be a good example. You lead by example, and you take care of business. Verse 14, he says, the mouth of, a str of strange women is a deep pit. He that is abhorred of the Lord shall fall therein. This is a strong statement. The man that God hates will fall with a strange woman. That's bad. You don't want God's hatred on your life. You need to stay away from the strange woman. He says that her mouth is like a deep pit. What's that mean? What's it say? Smooth as honey, right? But it's bitter in the end. It's death. Her ways are the ways to death. Be careful of, of another woman trying to say things. A strange woman. That means that, that she's not your woman. When there's a woman talking to you and she is not your wife, if you're single, get away. If you're married, get away. Flee fornication. He that is abhorred of the Lord shall fall therein. Do you want to be hated of God? I would hope not. If you want to be loved of God, if you want to be honored in, by God, then obey Him. And so here he's teaching children, right? Don't be lazy. Don't run with whores either. Don't be around them. Reject whoredoms. We should eschew evil. You should avoid those things. Verse 15, he says, Foolishness 
is bound in the heart of a child, but the rod of correction shall drive it far from him. So you train your children to hate debt, to hate laziness, to hate whoredoms, right? I mean, whoredoms, the Bible talks about defiling yourself. You understand that if singles would understand that you become defiled when you lay with, I mean, it's just, it, it's terrible what happens to their body. I mean, if somebody just opened up the sewer and said, jump in, you'd say, no. But the world, the devil wants to make it seductive. Beware. Verse 16, it says, He that oppresseth the poor to increase his riches, and he that giveth to the rich shall surely come to want. You know, there are some very shady banking practices in America and debt practices and ways that people get others in debt, and that is not how we should be. We need to be producing things and creating things and working with our own hands. And if you, it says, he that oppresseth the poor to increase his riches. If your work or your job is getting you to extract money out of the poorest of the poor, you're probably in the wrong line of work. And we should train our children not to make money that way. Verse 17, bow down thine ear and hear the word of the wise and apply thine heart unto my knowledge. God's saying you need to bow down your ear. He's saying you need to go out of your way to get good understanding. You need to humble yourself. You need to slow down. You need to search it out. Think what he's saying. Bow down thine ear. Right? What the rest of the world is preaching is easy to come by, but to find the words of the Lord and the wisdom from God, you need to stop, slow down, and go out of your way to listen to it. You need to humble yourself to be able to receive it. But then he says, apply. He says, bow down thine ear and hear the words of the wise and apply thine heart unto my knowledge. Once you get something, make an application in your life. Once God gives you some wisdom from the word of God, apply it, do what it says, and you'll be blessed. Verse 18, for it is a pleasant thing if thou keep them within thee. They shall withal be fitted in thy lips. Again, he's talking about what comes out of your lips. Well, how did it come out? What had to be kept in you? You hear wisdom. You apply it to your heart. You make sure you're after God's understanding and knowledge. And then it's a pleasant thing. Then it's a good thing. Then you have peace in life, and it will start coming out of your mouth. We've got to keep wisdom. When we started this out in Proverbs, he says, Wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore, get wisdom, and with all thy getting, get understanding. Make a goal to get wisdom. Make a goal to get understanding from God. And then once you get it, what do you do? You apply it. You keep it. You hold on to it. You practice it. You exercise it. You preach it to others. Why? Look at verse 19. That thy trust may be in the Lord. I have made known to thee this day even to thee. He's saying, why did I give you all these words? Why am I reminding you that I'm giving you wisdom? That thy trust may be in the Lord. All throughout the Bible, he wants us to understand our confidence should be in God. Right? Hear the words of the wise. Apply it to thine heart. Keep it, right? Then it'll be well with thee. Why? So that thy trust may be in the Lord. This is so important because as Christians, this is probably where we fail the most. We rely on ourself. We lean onto our own understanding instead of leaning to God. You think about it. Trust in the Lord. When we pray, I make it a point in our prayer meeting to say, we trust you for results. God, we're asking this need. You know what we need, but I trust you to answer it. We're not, I'm, I don't go to God demanding. Well, God, you better answer. No, no, no. In humility, out of fear of the Lord, I ask for His power and I trust Him to provide what we need. And by saying trust, do you have confidence God can answer your prayer? Do you have confidence that He wants the best for you? Because that's what we ought to be searching out. That thy trust may be in the Lord. Look at verse 20. Have not I written to thee excellent things in counsels and knowledge? Man, I love it. You know, the God of the Bible is the God of love. He's, he's not confusing us. He's not making it mysterious. It's not like the, the Freemasonic handbook where it says that you have to intentionally deceive others. And, you know, and, and the Jews' religion says the same thing. It's okay to lie to the goyim. Well, guess what? The Bible says God wants us to know the truth. And He wants us to share the truth. And He wants us to, to, to help others by preaching the truth. He says, Have I not written unto thee excellent things? in counsels and knowledge, that I might make thee know the certainty of the words of truth. God wants you to know you can trust the Bible, that you can trust Him to provide, that thy, might, that, right, what you say, that, that thy trust may be in the Lord, He said earlier. Verse 21, that I might make thee know the certainty of the words of truth, that thou mightest answer the words of truth to them that send unto thee. If you're a man of God, the king's going to answer 
the king's going to ask you questions. Friends are going to ask you questions. Well, doesn't the Bible say this? Well, what does it say about that? This is your opportunity, yeah. and you have to be prepared. Study, right? But what's he say? That thou mightest answer the words of truth to them that send unto thee. That you can say it as a surety. This is the truth. This is what the Bible says, and you can put it in the bank. In 1 Peter 3, he says, But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. How do we answer? With meekness and fear. What are we answering? The reason of hope. When should we be ready to answer? Always. Always. Somebody calls you at 4 in the morning and you're not, a, a, hey, I, I got a Bible question. I'm sorry, I've been up all night. Can you answer this? Yeah, where, where are you at? What's your question? Do it. Just help them. Answer them, right? Be an encouragement to people. God wants to use us to shine the light of His Word. Now look at verse 22. He continues this theme of teaching somebody how to be a good leader. He says, Rob not the poor because he is poor. Neither oppress the afflicted in the gate. We need to help people. And we shouldn't be stealing from people just because they're, oh, they won't notice. They're already poor. No, God will notice. God will notice. And we need to help the helpless. Right? What it say? He that hath a bountiful eye shall be blessed is what it said in verse 9. He that hath a bountiful eye shall be blessed for he giveth of his bread to the poor. Look at the next verse here in 23. He says, For the Lord will plead their cause and spoil the soul of those that spoiled them. Right? What he's saying is God is your avenger. But you as an individual don't run over the poor because even though you're God's child, he may have to avenge the poor upon you. This is a warning that we should not rob the poor because he's poor. Neither oppress the afflicted in the gate for the Lord will plead their cause and spoil the soul of those that spoiled them. God will avenge. God will get even. God will take care of those that can't take care of themselves. And as we follow Christ, that ought to be our same attitude. If it's a bum on the side of the street, he's 30 years old, he's able-bodied, he refuses to work because he wants to smoke heroin or shoot up drugs, whatever, right? Don't give him any money. But now if it's somebody that's trying to work and they're not making ends meet, they're going through a rough time, if it's some widow that just can't take care of business and, and she's a right, hey, take, take care of them. God bless you. Give it to them as a gift and don't expect anything in return. Have a bountiful eye. Take care of those that can't help themselves. That's what Jesus did. And we should have that same mentality. Look at verse 24 here. Proverbs 22, 24. Make no friendship with an angry man, and with a furious man thou shalt not go, lest thou learn his ways and get a snare to thy soul. This is a very strong warning. Leaders should not be known for being furious and angry. Right? Furious means mad, like madness, as in crazy. Like I knew this guy one time, and while he's preaching, like you could tell this guy was just seeing red. He couldn't even hold his, like he was just like angry, and it's like, dude, calm down. You don't even know, you're not even preaching the Bible anymore. You're just showing off of your anger. And some of the things that he said, in his anger, he said things that were wrong according to the scriptures, but he was just trying to show off, just trying to get angry about an issue, rather than preaching the word of God. The warning is, make no friendship with an angry man. Don't be associated with somebody that's known for their anger. Don't go with a furious man. Why? What's the warning? Lest thou learn his ways. If you learn the ways of an angry man, what's going to happen? Well, then it will be a snare unto your soul. You can watch the angry man get away with something. You can say, that was cool. I want to do it. And then you go do it. And guess what? You're trapped. You're busted. It causes you problems. Yeah. Well, Brother Fannin, the Bible says, be angry and sin not. Well, let's look at that. Hold your finger here and go to Ephesians chapter 4. Because most know, be ye angry and sin not. And they say, see, you can be angry, but what does it mean to sin not within anger? And this is where most angry people mess up. Because I'm going to warn you, hate destroys churches. There are churches, they've lost their first love, they've lost their brotherly love, they're known for their hate, and they're destroying themselves. They're bickering inside, they're destroying themselves, they're tearing each other apart, and God's not blessing it. You know, there was an Australian missionary a little while back. He, he hated the Muslims so bad that he made it a point to go and get in a fight on the news with him. Y'all probably know who I'm talking about. And many people, well, yeah, we got to protect him. But, you know, he had a church in a foreign country as a missionary that was thriving and soul winning. And he said, I want to be known for my hate. I've made friendship with an angry man. And I want to be known that I'm furious just like him. And I want to learn his ways. And guess what happened? It was a snare unto his soul. It was a snare unto that church. 
You understand God actually destroyed that church. That candlestick was removed because the pastor of the church was known for anger. He was separated from his family for a month. And his life is still in disarray because of being known for his anger. Oh, the news found out he hated Muslims. Good job. And guess what? The church is no longer soul winning. It doesn't exist. That's foolishness. That's not of God. There's a U.S. preacher that had a similar problem. He hated queers so bad he made a public statement letting everybody know the only problem was he, had, he was in an agreement with his uh, 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 employer about representing his employer and he broke the agreement with his employer and he said things that his employer disagreed with. Oh yeah, put him to death. And his employer said, uh, you've broken our covenant. You need to go. You're fired. Now listen, people will say, oh, well, you, you, you're supporting, you've got to support the man of God and whatever he says. Well, look, we will preach what the Bible says. The Bible says put queers to death and under God's righteous judgment and His authority and His government, that's what the Bible says. That's true. That's righteous. But you know what? I am not going to speak on behalf of somebody else and say that my employer should support this. If I've made an agreement with, with an employer, you shouldn't wonder or be amazed when you lose your job. If you agree to represent somebody, don't break your covenant. And look, our goal is, is not just to offend the enemy. Our goal, is this, this is spiritual warfare, our goal is to get people saved. And I think there are people that don't count the cost, they just go to war. They don't count the cost, they just say, let me pop off at the mouth, let me act like an angry man, and they don't count the cost that it will be a snare under their soul when they learn their ways. We need to avoid the angry man or, or you will become paranoid yourself. You'll think, oh, they're, they're after me, everybody's after me, they must all be reprobates. Listen, that's not the spirit of God. That is the spirit of fear. We need to have the spirit of love. He says, Make no friendship with an angry man, and with a furious man thou shalt not go, lest thou learn his ways and get a snare to thy soul. You're in Ephesians chapter 4, and this is what the naysayers will say. Well, I have every right to be angry. Ephesians 4.26 says, Be ye angry, and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon thy wrath. And this is what they, 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 they want to take it out of context. See, I can be angry. There is righteous indignation. Well, there is. That's true. And there's a time and a place for all things. A time for war, a time for peace, right? A time for hate, a time for love. That's what the Bible teaches. But if you let the sun go down upon your wrath and you wake up angry, you have failed. If you're known for anger every single day of the week, you have failed. You have sinned. You have sinned. That's out of balance. Look at verse 15 in this chapter. Let's take it in context. But speaking the truth in love, what? Speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ. He's saying the people that are angry all the time, they don't have love. Why? Because they haven't grown up yet. They're acting like a five-year-old that's not getting their way, and they think they can just throw a fit, and that, that, that's cool. Well, guess what? God doesn't like it. God doesn't appreciate it. And God will remove your candlestick if you don't repent. Look at verse 25. Wherefore, putting away lying, speak every man truth with his neighbor... For we are members one of another. Be ye angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon thy wrath, neither give place to the devil. So the man that's angry all the time has given place to the devil. They're not speaking truth with their neighbor. They're not speaking truth in love. They're, they're just perverting the words of God and using the Bible as a club to be a bully. That's not what a Christian should be known for. That is not righteous leadership. Look at, the, look at verse 29 here. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. If you're known for always saying something hateful, are you known for speaking grace? Are you known for edifying your brothers? Are you known for ministering to others? No, you're known for corrupt communication, and you have failed. For the grace of the lips, the king shall be his friend, we read earlier in Proverbs 22. Right? That it may minister grace unto the hearers. That's the goal. When you open your mouth, are you ministering grace? Are you letting co corrupt communication come out of your mouth? Look at verse 30. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. If you're angry all the time, the sun goes down and it comes back up and you're still angry. You've given place to the devil. You're in sin and guess what? You're grieving the Holy Spirit. People use that phrase of grieving the Holy Spirit as if like, you know, it's just any time you're sinning. And, and there's an application there, you know. 
You know, somebody says, well, I, I, I ate more food than I should have. I was grieving the Holy Spirit. Or, or I should have preached the gospel. I was grieving the Holy Spirit. Maybe so. But the actual application in context is letting wicked words come out of your mouth. Letting an evil spirit work through a Christian. He says, grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. Do you understand? Grieving the Holy Spirit is when you're known for anger and evil speaking. That is a sin. So when it says be angry and sin not, I would recommend you start by being angry with your own sin of pride, your own sin of foolishness, your own shortcomings, and ask God to help you hate the sin in your life. Instead of always looking to blame somebody else for something, or instead of always saying, let's go pick a fight with the enemy, maybe that's not how God wants you to fight. Maybe he wants you to fight this warfare spiritually by opening up the Bible and preaching the gospel, not by being known as an angry man. Look at the next verse, verse 21. And be ye kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. If you're known for anger instead of forgiveness, you're a fool. You are not obeying the Bible. If you're not known for being tenderhearted as a Christian, I mean, David was known for being tenderhearted. He was tender to the things of the Lord. He helped other people. He loved other people. Go back to Proverbs chapter 22. David wrote this psalm to his son so that his son wouldn't be a fool, so that his son would have wisdom and be a good leader and help the people that he was commanded to help. As a leader, there was people that were under him that he was there to encourage them and edify them and minister unto them. And people have lost their focus. As Christians, we need to remember that we are kings and priests, right? We are a, we are a royal nation, right? We are peculiar people. God looks at us as spiritual royalty over this earth. And we need to lead by example, and that's through a spirit of love, not anger. In verse 26, Proverbs 22, 26, he says, Be not one of them that strike hands, or of them that are sureties for debts. So again, it keeps on this path of teaching a child what to do, what not to do. Don't go into debt. If you can avoid it, don't make an agreement. Don't shake hands for debt. Don't sign for debt that you don't need. Verse 27, If thou hast nothing to pay, why should he take away thy bed from under thee? He's saying, be careful, you can lose everything. Right? Well, what's the application for today? Well, your bed's okay, but it's not as nice as you would like. You go out and you sign up and you get in debt. You go buy a $1,000 bed, and you throw the bed away that you have. Then that $100 payment comes in, and two months into it, you can't pay for your $1,000 bed, and they come and take your bed. Now you have no bed. Guess what? You'd have been better off to start saving money instead of throwing the old bed away, instead of buying something on debt, save money instead of going into debt, and striking hands, and sureties for debts. Look at verse 28. Remove not the ancient landmark which thy fathers have set. You know, he, he's going back to not uh, getting gained dishonestly. You know, in, in America, you can actually move a fence line, and if nobody questions it, you own their land, and that's a wicked law. The same laws in America that if somebody comes and squats in your property, then they can just take the house. That's wicked. Those laws are wicked. Those are not righteous. And he's warning that, that you know, that we should not be getting money from people dishonestly. That's what we need to teach our children. Verse 29, last verse. Seest thou a man diligent in his business? He shall stand before kings. He shall not stand before mean men. Now, the mean men there means menial or lower, right? How do you get the king to want to hear what you have to say? Well, you get wisdom and you obey, right? You speak good things, he says. But here he says, Seest thou a man diligent in his business? He shall stand before kings. How do I hang out with business owners? Will you be a good business owner? You take care of business. And as Christians, it is our job to do the best we can. We need to lead by example, especially when it's difficult, especially when it's very trying, when others would say it's impossible. That's your opportunity to shine as a Christian. I can do all things through Christ with strength with me. And if that means digging a ditch better than the next guy, so do it. Brother Ross was actually telling an example of that, working with a 
working with a uh, father-in-law or somebody back in the day and he's just like well I'm gonna get in there and I'm gonna outwork these other two guys and he did and then he's like okay well now you're the supervisor he didn't have to work that hard moving forward because he showed himself as a responsible individual somebody that was diligent in business and he said this is a guy that can be trusted that takes business seriously and again this is for Christians how can we be good Christians how can we have the wisdom in leadership well be diligent in your business see a thou a man diligent in his business he shall stand before kings. He shall not stand before mean men. What do we start with? Verse 1, a good name is rather to be chosen than great riches and loving favor rather than silver and gold. Business or your job or work or your family, it's not just about what you can get. It's about what you can give to others. Maintaining a good name. Having loving favor by demonstrating love and being diligent in business. Because listen, the Christian life is business. It's like God said, hey, guess what? I'm putting you in franchise. I'm giving your own ministry of reconciliation. You have the gospel, you need to share that gospel with others. Right? In Acts 6, he says, Wherefore, brethren, look ye out among you, seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. Guess what? The church is business. And I don't mean we're for profit, we're shearing the sheep. No, I mean we need to take God's work as business as very seriously. Proverbs 22 was written from a father to a son on how to be a good leader. 